a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the seminar and lecture series at uh, Ahmedabad University at the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we are very delighted and excited uh, to present a very you know, fascinating and promising conversation today um, with uh, award-winning author and journalist uh, Snigdha Poonam and Professor Mona Mehta. And uh, before we just begin with that uh, conversation uh, in a few minutes from now, I would just like to say a, a little uh, bit about what we try to aim and what we try to achieve through the seminar and lecture series at Ahmedabad University. Um, having an emphasis on interdisciplinary approach uh, to uh, liberal uh, education, we really uh, lay a lot of uh, you know, emphasis and stress on the idea that students should be able to interact and engage with uh, distinguished scholars and practitioners and who are uh, very you know, doing good research, um, whether it is related to certain academic disciplines or whether it is related to certain very important contemporary issues. And uh, with that uh, aim or with that goal in mind, uh, we organize uh, these events under the seminar and lecture series, wherein we uh, are fortunate to get uh, such distinguished scholars and uh, researchers, authors, writers to come and talk uh, about their own exciting work and also to uh, you know, engage and interact with our students and faculty members here at Ahmedabad University. So with uh, keeping on with that tradition, uh, we are very excited today to welcome you to this uh, uh, conversation between uh, author Stingda Poonam and uh, Mona Mehta, Professor Mona Mehta from the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, now, I'm also very uh, delighted to introduce today's speaker, um, who's actually uh, written a book which has also captivated my interest because of my own uh, uh, interest and research on uh, um, India's um, youth uh, in who are entering politics because uh, uh, I look at it from an uh, angle of you know uh, political entrance uh, or entrance into electoral politics but uh, her, her detailed outlines and her detailed stories uh, in her first book uh, has really uh, put out uh, how uh, how India's youth thinks and what are the aspirations of India's youth uh, uh, speak today and Snigda Poonam uh, is a journalist and writer based in India uh, her articles have appeared in The Scroll, The Caravan, The Times of India, The New York Times, The Guardian, Economist, uh, Granta, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, and The Financial Times, as well as The Hindustan Times, for which she contributes on national affairs. Her essay, Lady Singham's Mission Against Love, was the runner-up in the Bodley Head Financial Times Essay Prize in 2015. She won the 2017 Journalist of Change Award of uh, Bournemouth University for an investigation of student suicides that appeared on Huffington Post. Dreamers, which is the book that I was talking about, uh, is a first book and it is a very, uh, very well reviewed and well uh, accomplished kind of a book which won 2018's Crossword Book Award for nonfiction and was also long listed in 2019 for Pen American uh, Literary Awards. Uh, and 2022, she is uh, due with the next book, which is also on a very exciting uh, and uh, equally interesting kind of a topic, which has a very well and detailed research uh, about which uh, my, my colleague, Professor Mona Mehta, uh, will be talking about a little bit and about which the conversation will also reveal uh, in due course of time. So once again, I welcome all of you to this fascinating conversation and uh, I will now hand it over to uh, Mona to take it further from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sartak, and uh, welcome again, Snigda Poonam. Um, I remember uh, how excited I was when I first read your book when it, when it came out, and I couldn't stop talking about it to people. Um, you have been such a perceptive observer of Indian youth in the 21st century. You've sought out millennials in small towns talked to men and women about the dreams they are chasing, documented their career trajectories, and examined their aspirations and frustrations. Um, the reason they are, uh, you know, your book is, uh, you know, so so popular is, is, is kind of difficult, is not uh, difficult to figure out, right? I mean, if 65% uh, of Indians are below the age of 35 years, um, 
it's pretty clear that if you want to understand the journey of India, you'd have to understand uh, the journey of India's youth. Uh, so apart from the fact that it's really well written, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised that the book has been such a success. And so your writings give us this much needed insights into understanding new India and why, uh, you know, um, and, and I think that's why we're so privileged to have you here today, Snikta. Uh, so let me start off, you know, your fantastic book, uh, Dreamers, How Young Indians Are Changing the World, profiles incredible young people in small town India. Uh, they're from internet entrepreneurs to wannabe, uh, you know, models, village fixers, cow vigilantes, life coaches, you know, and English tutors to college student union presidents. What did you find in your investigations when you chase these people, when you try to, you know, profile them, track them down? Uh, thanks, Mona and, and Sartak. I think that was a very, very kind introduction to me and my book. Um, I think what really um, struck me in interviews for dreamers and, and not just that, you know, in my usual work, whether I'm covering an election or a riot or a usual protest, it's, you know, it's just like, it's, it's this desire, the move that you, you know, the moment that you leave um, the cities and go to the towns and villages and, and in some instances, even in, in, the, in the pockets in say a city like Delhi and Bombay is the, young people's like desire to really break out, to do something that uh, you wouldn't really expect them to do in their circumstances, or they wouldn't expect themselves to do in their circumstances. So, and whatever those circumstances are, you know, and depending on where they come from, they, those can be very different, you know, for a woman or for someone from um, an oppressed caste or for a minority community, these are very different dreams. But wherever they are, the common thing I saw was this desire to go up. Um, and so like dreamers, for me, I mean, it just became like a study of that, that dream of upward mobility and how that interacted with, um, you know, the larger forces shaping India, identity politics, or, you know, the, the social conflicts that we're seeing, or even like, you know, um, just the, you know, just the way that some things get highlighted um, when we talk about the Indian economy and not the others. To, to be to be clearer, you know how employment is 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 such a uh, complex. It's, it's a common concern for every person that I meet, and yet it's not really a uh, a political force yet. Uh, so I mean that that I mean those are some of the trends that I came back with, and I. And I think that as I go along, it's been four years, four years, I think three years since the book came out. And I continue to meet young people in, in similar parts of um, the country. And I see the same desire, but I also see that there is an impatience or there is a need to have more agency um, in how their, how, you know, how their lives will pan out. So. Um, in some sense, yeah, those like those trends remain the same, but I think that the situation is far more urgent today. I mean, especially in in the pandemic. Right. No, the, the that's really interesting. You know, the desire to move up. You know, the sort of the that that looms large. You know, in the stories of these young people, and you know, it, it, the context of that is also important. This is post liberalization India. Right. And one of the beliefs about post liberalization India is um, that, uh, you know, uh, the idea that there are more opportunities today than they ever were in the sort of uh, the earlier license permit Raj India, you know, of, of yesteryears. And um, there's a belief that the private sectors opened up vast opportunities for young people for lucrative jobs. And, uh, you know, so they're dreaming big in this context. Right. But do you think this narrative about the tremendous opportunities um, for youth in 21st century India is actually very, is it accurate according to you? While writing a recent piece quite vividly. Um, and it's that, you know, I mean, I remember the editor asking me to define the Indian dream. And I think it was, it, it, it took me back to the moment that, you know, the, 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 the liberalization of Indian economy. And, and I'm sure that in the few years after that, and, you know, Patrick would be a better person to, all forth on that. that. That must have been possible for a generation of Indians to, um, you know, rise if they got 
the right education or the at the right job or move to the cities and um, you know to to rise to the to the middle class. But I I don't think that that dream has held up, and 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 that's why I, when I even like think back to dreamers, I feel like I was so naive thinking that if someone can just go to school or just move to a city or get a job, that everything will be fine because. i think now that perhaps that's that is not it i mean this going to a school um is not enough i mean it also matters if you know you can stay in school or you know to what to what um especially sticking especially of girls you know what is the class at which your parents decide that ab bas ho gaya then now the you must um drop out and get married or or in terms of like or in the context of people from a press caste you know the the dropout rates and it just feel to stay in school to not face discrimination to for your family to have access to healthcare and and for you to have access to nutrition and i could go on and on about like systemic issues that i've started thinking more about um you know in skilling or just like this huge rural urban gap that i i think creates so many hurdles for for people dreaming in in towns and villages you know i have seen since dreamers i followed people who 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 were on that trajectory of the indian dream you know getting out of college getting a job moving to the city and then and those then then you know those dreams not working out for them because they 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 would have to come back for one reason or the other and i'm not even talking about the lockdown the lockdown story and you know just the simple fact that there is still there are still no opportunities for someone you know who's seriously um thinking of rising up in where he or she is um so i yeah so i don't think that it's um if that indian dream if we can call that the indian dream that it has held up right i mean um, that yeah and, thank you yeah. uh, you know i mean i think that's 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 very perceptive because i think i think what you're trying to say is that yes we have seen uh, the mushrooming of opportunities but that's also just a partial story right but the story is far more complex um, there have been many hurdles right and and as uh, you know and uh, and i think it's important for us to figure out you know what these hurdles are why is it uh, that you know despite having higher levels of education in more young people having college college degrees that hasn't translated into them getting employment right and so I mean that sort of uh, you know gets me to think about this moment in September 2014 when the then newly elected prime minister Narendra Modi addressed this uh, you know huge crowd in New York's Madison Square you know and uh, in in front of cheering NRI fans and you know he said uh, famously said at that time that India has three things that no one in the world has right and he said uh, those mm -hmm. things are uh, democracy demographic dividend and demand right um so you know when we talk about mm -hmm. demographic dividend you know we talk about this this uh, the situation where uh, a country benefits greatly in terms of economic uh, you know growth when you have the vast majority of the population in an earning mm -hmm. or working age right so the question is uh, you know the, the but the, but the reality is you know that india is today facing one of the biggest employment crisis uh, in our modern history and uh, and that has only been made worse by the pandemic so what according to you seems mm -hmm. to have gone wrong you know in all uh, uh, you know in the story of india's demographic dividend uh, dividend especially in the past 6 7 years i mean and and how do you think young people are coping with this um uh, yeah i mean i really have to go back to that speech and probably sort of you know um <laughs> I mean, that speech is not important, point point, you but, know. But uh, but yeah, like you know, I mean, that that, that the idea know, of the promise, right? Be, yeah, I agree with you. I think it would be really interesting. Um, I think that yes, I I I don't think that we only have an employment crisis. Of course, we do, but we also have an economic crisis, right? I mean, I don't think that the demographic dividend that everyone spoke of, that I believed in, um, growing up, has resulted in the kind of economic growth that people would have expected and. and they did and and they already have written india off in that context and i think that i'll go back to some of what i said um to your last question which is that you know it's yes it's not enough for people to um go to school or or to move to cities or get a job um you know i mean i this 
one of the things that I've seen, not just in my reporting, but a lot of um, academic studies as well, is 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 like the that degree of mobility just keeps like it's very that doesn't rise. I mean, so um, you know, it's totally possible for a farmer's child to come to the city and become an Uber driver or a daughter to become to work at a beauty parlor, but they are not able to rise beyond that. And there are so many things that hold them back. Just like take access to English medium education or, you know, just like they're able to, like, their ability to, to really sort of exist in a big city, the expenses. And what remains true is that level of aspiration. I was, I don't know if you've seen the study by the three economists, but it, it surveyed Indian youth or I don't I don't exactly remember the age the range of age, but but the majority of people that they interviewed identified themselves as middle class. Um, but in terms of their spending power, they were far from any definition of what middle class is for Indians. Um, and so they, in that in that you know that large gap between their own perception of being middle class and the ways in which they then try to be middle class actually um, is that that. The gap that interests me and and how people bridge that gap remains you know keeps changing and keeps changing at a really fast rate um so you know i and i and i continue to follow that that story right um yeah i mean that is a very interesting story because it's also it gets at really what are these aspirations you know i mean one of the things that uh, you know I talk there's a, there's another study actually the biggest youth study that csds did in delhi and they surveyed you know over 10 years young people uh, below between the age of 19 and 35 years and they found mm -hmm. that overwhelmingly yeah. uh, you know young people actually desire sarkari jobs <laughs> whether it's in rural areas mm. or urban areas. And so, um, you know, um, I mean, how do we make sense of these aspirations in post-liberalization India, you know, where on the one hand, we're, ta we're talking about the tremendous opportunities of the private sector. And then the, the aspiration, and they're still aspiring for the good life, the middle-class life, but the route to that, as you said, is so much more complicated. So, you know, I mean, and maybe, you know, I mean, I know you're still thinking about these things and writing about it, but do you have some initial thoughts on, you know, how do we make sense of this, the desire for sarkari jobs, you know, in post-liberalization India? It's it, it's very, very clear for me to, uh, very easy for me to understand, actually, because they, they would want, they would like a private job if they could find a private job, you know, I mean, that that paid them well and that, and that, that you know, was reliable and that they could, uh, you know, that they could have while staying where they did, where they wanted to stay, where it was more realistic, you know, more just, it, it made sense for them to stay. So there are so many issues there, but I think that if you just think of one aspect, which is like entry-level salaries, uh, you know, the majority of India's organized workforce is, is you know so pays so poorly people like the majority of workers in india's organized um labor force earn you know below 20000 rupees a month i mean that is a very very low income to earn after you have completed all your checked all your lists of that indian dream it just it just doesn't work out especially if you if you live in a city so um, so people want a government job because it, it it pays well. You know, I mean, I already listed out. You can you can have a government job in in Kanpur or in 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 Mysore, and you can uh, it it is reliable. It's and you know, come lockdown, you would not be, you'd not be like you know, be jobless overnight. So I mean, there. Like, I don't think it's anything else. Right, but that's but then that then the idea of enterprise culture is puzzling, right? I mean, are these are these enterprising young people? It's yeah, it, it's not puzzling actually. If you they that and that's why it's you know India's story is so bizarre because on the one hand you will see the majority of people wanting a government job, and then if you actually talk to the same people as I do, they they, they sort of aspire between these two extremes. Yeah, the government job chahiye, ya fir apna startup karna hai, badi company karni hai, and uske beech mein koi options hi nahi hai na ki you will get a decent income in a in a private job that does not that whole bracket is missing from india's workforce so the, the 
so I, I know people who are preparing for a government exam at the same time they are you know hustling their way through some internet scheme or getting together with friends seeing which be over you know some kind of like service based um service based sort of company where they can monetize anything and there is there is so much effort in finding market gaps i mm. i keep finding these ideas at a very uh local level that i don't think you will even find in tech hubs like gurgaon or bangalore mm. no i think you really pointed to an uh, you know uh, one of the sort of the big elephants in the room which is that the private sector just hasn't created the number of jobs that we need um and even when there are jobs i mean there are all kinds of other hurdles you know um it's not just a simple supply demand issue but that's a huge problem um but you know we'll we'll sort of uh, you know step back a little and 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 try to kind of uh, maybe i'd like to ask you something uh, about you know the world view of these young people today you know um and we'll come back to this mm-hmm. these hurdles um you know in the dreamers um you have this you know you have these lines about how you portray the cultural wo- and 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 you know ideological world, world view of uh, the young person today and especially in the decade uh, in the past mm-hmm. decade which has coincided with the decline of the congress and the rise of uh, modi led bjp and you say and i'm going to quote you uh, they are the most global young indians ever but with the narrowest ideas of what it means to be indian based on language region religion and an exaggerated notion of the country's pre-colonial glories a majority of them are frustrated with india's old politics synonymous in their minds uh, with the congress party's stodgy heavy-handed liberalism but their idea of a new politics is that of a, of the ruling bharatiya janata party's um, one of exclusionary nationalism and sectarian division and i unquote So why is the youth today drawn to this brand of new exclusionary politics and and what do you think will be the consequences of this Um I I think that it's a it's sold to them really well um and I think since dreamers I've spent some time also trying to understand how the message itself is made and and circulated and to give this establishment credit they do a really good job of it we, you know we're talking about mohalla level um recruits whose whose job it is to like only make whatsapp messages to or to spread them and so i think that um that that deserves its own due um but other than that i think it's also a constituency that is very easy to um, to sell this message too because of you know just the uncertainties in their own life and not just work related but also in terms of identity they they see so much changing around them they most of them definitely do not want to do what their parents did or their grandparents did especially um i mean especially to in in north india where i spend more time uh, researching and so they they do like feel sense of dislocation and and i don't mean that it's just one kind of person i think you know there is a different thing going on with men and totally something else going on with women in terms of um that dislocation or could be caste based or religion based and um th- i mean that dislocation and i think that a lot of that aspiration or or the lack of that aspiration going anywhere it's easy to politicize that into into this kind of identity politics that makes someone the the target of your um you know your anger and a lot of this like politics that they they they, they are fed feeds on this this anger so you know i mean when will i have seen so many so called cow vigilantes just go on and on about not cows or or hinduism or or modi or religion but just but just like women how they are going out and getting jobs or forgetting their place in in society same goes for you know brahmins and how they talk about the lower caste so called lower caste in their in their villages or how hindus in meerut will talk about muslims in their own mohalla getting a bigger house or going getting um salaried jobs etc so so i think that a lot of this anger is economic what i do not mean to say is that um you know it's always about them feeling that their opportunities have been taken away by someone else i think it's like easier to 
for them to frame that in economic terms than to say that they have these deep rooted prejudices that um, that they would rather not say um, or talk about and just just blame blame someone else for where they find themselves stuck at. Hmm. It's really interesting the the sort of the com the heady combination of feeling. Uh, like the loser, you know, uh, being left out by globalization, being left out by the socioeconomic churning in India, and then sort of channeling that anger into a sort of an identity politics and going between framing that as an economic uh, issue, when it's also a sort of an identity issue and prejudice issue and all of that. Um, you know, and, 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 and related to this is, is the question about, you know, yes, they're all looking for opportunities, but you also, you, you know, you also, uh, talk about how young people really care about freedoms, you know, and that, that they're, they're hankering to, to have small freedoms, you know, the freedom to love someone they want, freedom to eat what they want, what, wear what they want. And I'm just wondering how this sort of sits with their desire and attraction for Hindu nationalism that seems committed to restrict rather than expand personal freedoms, particularly related to, you know, marriage and food, for instance. How do, how do these two things sort of connect, you know, the desire to have more freedom, mm. just like a lot of young people have, and then also to support a politics that's patently about restricting freedoms. And how do they make sense? How would you make sense of the, this, this, this bewildering choice? I, I mean, I, I think that there is, it's, it's, we can't say that, you know, the majority of India's youth is attracted to the BJP's, um, line of ideology and i if i said that in the past i must have been like exaggerating i i, I think that there if you are freedoms are subjective right so i mean i think if you're a man if you are upper caste if you are if you're hindu then you do already have a lot of freedoms and and eight so it's not really you know, it's easier for you to to believe in an ideology that um, that talks about taking away other people's freedoms, and also um, yeah, totally forgotten what I was going to say. And uh, yeah, and and also, you know, it, it's convenient that um, that you know it gives you the agency on a like everyday basis to to go to go out and control someone else's freedom, which is what you know, which is what you as you're saying in so many acts of everyday violence by Hindu vigilantes, even, even in the pandemic. Um, as far as women go, women go, as far as, uh, you know, Muslims go, as far as, you know, I mean, still, I would still say like large sections of um, oppressed caste go, they, they do see, they do see that um, their freedoms being taken away. I mean, in spite of, in spite of the political rhetoric, in spite of like, you know, um, the BJP's um very assertive efforts to to co-op the co-op the um oppressed castes I in smaller sections of youth and but i see that more of being more and more vocal maybe not so much when i was reporting dreamers but definitely more now uh and my hope for the you know for the foreseeable future is that those voices you already saying that in 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 the kind of anxiety that young activists are giving this establishment, whether they're, you know, students or like random climate activists. So um, I, I see that larger, you know, I mean, I, I do not have any sense of the numbers, but I, but I see that it's not only the JNU student type young people that are standing up against the government or even like in private conversations with me speaking, speaking up, even in the villages I hear from young people about the, the hypocrisy of this establishment or just, just the lies on economy or, or employment. So uh, I just think that there is no outlet for them to find that voice um, amplified politically. Um, so I agree that because we have like a, you know, a very sort of Hindu male, North Indian kind of political majority, BJP does feel like it has the overwhelming support of the youth, but um, but I but I see that that may not always remain the same. Hopefully, right. 
No, that's 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 actually uh, great because it, it tells us that you know if you want to understand India's youth, we we have to understand their worldview. It's also as far more complex. It's not unidimensional. It's not monochromatic. There are uh, you know there are layers and layers. And 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 while we might you know hear the voices of some uh, you know being amplified, there are a lot of others, and we haven't just yet seen so far a sort of consolidated uh, you know. Um, expression of that you know in, in in a politically significant way and maybe time will tell um so so that's 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 great um you know i i want to uh, snigda now go back to a, a thread that we we already talked about and 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 actually to your current and future you know work and and which is that if aspiration is one of the key words in the story of india's youth uh, their desperation to succeed is an equally important part of that story and uh, this desperation is visible in the raging culture of scams uh, that you have been reporting on in fact that is the topic of your next book and um, you know um, can you tell us about this and and you know what is the relationship perhaps also you know as you tell us about you know this culture of scams that you're seeing um, you know what's the relationship between scams and skills even you know because we talked about some of these issues uh, a little bit a little while ago i i see a clear connection i i think that in just the last five years you've seen an explosion in smartphone access access or internet access um down to the villages and and if you you know really look at the numbers of police complaints or just press complaints this like you know pick up a newspaper and read about scams that you you didn't have that situation 5 years ago um so if people are skilling themselves in just using smartphones or and and internet as um as a way to earn an income and it has gone in all kinds of ways and i think scams is one of them um what i what i am interested in in is this um you know is the is the way in which i see the the young indians like taking showing more agency uh, i mean i still when i went out in 2014 or in the in the years just after that i would still hear people talk about modi and government and jobs related you know who comes to power to their prospects i no longer see that at a at a mass level i see more and more people talking about how what they can do for themselves um and i see i see that amplifying with every day and you know the 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 rise of um you know every day very like individual level scams is to me related to that like mass scale um exercising of that agency in their own future in their own upward mobility it's, it's no longer something that the young people expect modi to do in fact when i covered the last election 2019 so many people told me in my part of india that it's, it's and i have those quotes they said it is not the government's job to give us jobs um you know if you don't go out and do something it is your fault you are lazy um and i think that that is a message that they are internalizing more and more and to some extent the government is telling them that you know yeah, the jobs that that's aapko net par nirbhar bharat jobs create kar sakte ho right yeah yeah and that that's that and that message is being internalized and and to some extent that that is a bifurcation bifurcation they tell support who they support and they understand that finding a job or finding a better life is is my job um right. their it's it's is their job um so you know and then there is this huge role that technology has played so i mean forget um uh, agency or or politics or technology just think about think about our an average indian's exposure to an everyday scam today you know, whether you talk about someone calling you up for kyc or some lottery that you won or some bank loan or something that someone selling on olx every other person has at least faced these calls or these whatsapp messages if not fallen for them and so if you really talk about volume which i am trying to study then you you're talking about millions of people who are doing this um you know villages upon villages where people just do this not just in one district in jharkhand but now that has multiplied 
in so many parts of india and rajasthan has its own set of villages haryana has its own karnataka has its own um you know so what's going on with uh, with all of these people and um there are their villages in which they like they change the scam wholesale every month or every week so there is mm-hmm. that there is that huge uh, i see a huge wave and um you know i mean if you really talk about and, and you know and you see the broader news about where what the employment situation is and to 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 say that 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 india's economy of fraud is is a more um, you know employs more people than the so called private sector that might for in some years that not that might not be an exaggeration for me to say so um hmm. so yeah that's so fascinating i mean you know i mean so i hear you saying that we're talking about a scale of scams that is Uh, unprecedented today you know um and and that in some convoluted way um this is a reflection of so many perhaps failures you know of uh, you know and the lack of opportunities in the private sector the withdrawal of the state and 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 and, and perhaps perhaps an unexpected way of resting agency back into your hands as a young person when you know that you have to fend for yourself i mean and so there's just so many interesting ideas there and but you know i want to sort of contextualize this this business of scams a little bit and the ethical void uh, that it clearly reflects in in today's india and you know you say and i quote uh, and i quote you from the dreamers if i had to boil their philosophy down to two words it would be whatever works like it or not young yeah. india is what it is uh, unsatisfied unscrupulous unstoppable uh, few indians i met had a clear sense of right and wrong few g- gave a damn about it um so uh is there anything new uh you know apart from the, the the scale that you're talking about is there anything new about this culture of scams that you're seeing today given that you yourself said you know uh in that same paragraph that uh you know that mm-hmm. the idea of personal benefit over public good is actually mm-hmm. at the core of india's value system so yeah. um so so then the question is you know i mean what's new today other than the scale of this i mean if this is the, is this just about you know we're inherently a corrupt society we've been so for a while you mm-hmm. know we we don't really have ethical an ethical compass and you know um and to, so how how do you i mean and the reason i ask is because you know does it puzzle you that just two generations ago perhaps three generations ago young indians sacrificed private mm-hmm. gains for public good in 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 the fight to gain independence um so how do you make sense of yeah. this current political ethical void in india today i mean can we historicize this a little bit in you know this moment what's 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 peculiar about this moment well not so many things have changed i i wouldn't know where to start um i mean since i wrote that paragraph i i had i don't i have changed my mind about that thinking about that ethical void um in what way have you dreamers, changed uh, your I mean, I'll, so i'll explain mm-hmm. i'll explain um so when i was reporting dreamers there's a reason why the scammers is the last chapter in the book it's because for me i mean to me it seemed like that is the thing that the people came to at last mm-hmm. you know that something nothing was working out as a last so resort really, as a last resort someone mm-hmm. comes to the city gets fired can't pay rent or whatever you know or has gone to 100 interviews and is going to be sent back home and got i mean literally in a girl's case got get married off and they'll just pick up this job um but i i that is no longer so i know of so many uh youngsters 18 years old 19 years old who drop out of college because scamming is such a lucrative um career choice so you know it's no longer just a last resort it's a, it's a very profitable career choice and i don't mean that it's desperation alone i think it's a large gap between what you can the salary that you'll earn after years of hustling your way to the indian dream and the money that you can make from pulling one successful scam you know it's like literally 10000 to 1 lakh uh is you, know, you you can get a 10000 rupees salary in a month or you can make rupees 1 lakh with one successful bank fraud or you know i i was talking to the scammer on the phone just the other day he had called me to sell a 
so i had to go off on a story tangent but he no, called me no, to sell uh, a lottery lottery that ma'am aapko 25 lakh ki lottery lagi hai so i started talking to him and immediately he figured out that i i know what he's doing and then he was sharing and he said that sometimes in a good day he makes 2 3 lakhs a month he's 18 years old he lives in old delhi um he dropped out of college um to just do this so it's not just desperation maybe he is all right his his father runs a business he could have done that job but um is but it just patience, it's also then, Stigna, is it, it is it is it is in patience it is like a frustration with how slow that indian dream unfolds um you know and like how and how many options there suddenly are because see there is a section of indians that are making a lot of money um people like us are living really well and then there and there are people who you know like i keep repeating who will work for years and years to and still be stuck at an 18000 20000 rupee salary and for them to think that you know we'll forget this job if i could just make a few calls a day and scam people like us or people i'm not even talking about people above us uh, it's it's a, it's a very it's a very nice situation so i think i see that but coming back to your question several other things have changed you know um forget about indian youth i think generally the way that corruption in india worked is changing it's no longer top to bottom in some cases it's like from rock bottom to top so you will have more and more cases at least i i have covered more and more cases as a journalist in in just recent past where you know villages are have plotted scam against the government um so you will have just to give you an example like a insurance i i remember this insurance scheme that i that i that i wrote about um where if villages would pretend to be dead in order to to claim to claim insurance from um from the companies and in some in, in a different case from the government so they they colluded with this gang which um which contacted the relatives of people who were registered in state hospitals as being terminal uh cancer patients and when they died the gang went to their houses and took their bodies and then ran them over um on in so called a framed road accidents and then the families got insurance from these companies and they they they, they gave the larger share to the scammers gang but they 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 got a fair share themselves and in a different case they the same scam happened um as part of a government scheme where the government was supposed to give people money if someone died so i mean you know like let's take tractor scheme government gives farmers tractors right on a, on some kind of some, some kind of scheme so these farmers in these not just one village but tens of villages came together and they would like to keep taking these tractors from the government and then selling them up uh, farmers would sell these tractors in kashmir and they made so much money um so i i i feel like i was i i i'm obsessed with these village scams these villagers enterprise and it's not just young people it's uh, it, that is like corruption in a way that i never understood not not only really understood it never never saw it you know my father was was a, was a government officer so corruption was something that i grew up with in everyday stories that he he came back home with of this how dams were not getting built or roads were not getting built and how much how money was traveling from the lowest level of administration to the chief ministers and 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 beyond and so the idea that that's how corruption works was was so intrinsic to my understanding of india and and in just 5 years as a journalist that understanding has been completely toppled um it's like a democratization so of scams oh yeah absolutely um and in and then the, to your last this last thread from that question about the ethical void and i know that i said that i don't think about that anymore is because i talk to victims too all the time of loan scams and insurance scams and all kinds of computer scams and and the victims themselves don't really see the scams as any kind of crime they so they don't see it as an ethical issue at all to. right yeah they don't they don't um they just they feel sorry and they want their money back but they, it's not like some kind of crime i mean forget legal but you know it, it just, they don't always see that as 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 a wrong as a wrong thing and in in a, in a different a different aspect to that is um 
is that there is often no the all overlap, overlap is between the scammers and the victims so i know someone who who works at a call center and who sells fake loans to americans um but i also know that he fell for a he took a instant loan from an app and then fell for a scam himself so it's we, we more more about that in the book but i but i also right. think that it's um, the economy is partly being a father forces is, has put them in a situation where they can be victim one day and scammer the next day so so yeah i mean just to sum up and then i'm just going to ask you my very last question i mean it seems like the ethical void is really uh, the problem of the the analysts rather than the people and really it's our problem uh, you know it doesn't uh, you know uh, it seems like the way uh, you see this is this is is it isn't at all in the horizon of you know their world uh those who are both victims and perpetrators of of scams um but uh, we i'd love to hear more you know when your book comes out um and you know in the interest of time we're already running out of the q and a time so i'm going to ask you my last question and in and um you know it it it's about kind of i want to quote a very poignant quote in in the epilogue of of dreamers you know um uh, you're you know where you're um you know you're talking about the millions of youth who don't succeed right but they don't stop dreaming right mm -hmm. and i want to quote you uh, i do not for a moment think they will ever stop trying to become rich powerful or famous uh, no matter where they uh, you know uh, they can't go any further they have nothing to go back to so they will remain suspended between reality and their dreams it's like flying into outer space without a return plan no matter where you end up the sun still shines brighter and the stars are at your fingertips unquote these these are beautiful lines and you know what did you mean by this and 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 Thank and you. finally like you know what does the future hold for the vast majority of indian youth who are stuck in suspension you know between mm -hmm. the reality and their dreams um i think that you know that point of suspension or that um that experience of suspension is already changing and that's what the next book is about i i used to feel i used to see like much more frustration um when the dreams failed but now i see either like more resignation in that you know this is not going to work out or people just do are more driven to do whatever it will take and that for them to make that decision is becoming easier and easier so for better or worse i think that um they understand that time is short and and they can't you can't keep trying i mean i i still see that people don't want to go back because there's always in their mind this whole where they are and what is back and what is forward so they do not want to go back but uh they'll they'll it's more positive and negative right i i keep hearing these ideas um that they have about what to do how to make money you know i just to like give you a very uh interesting example um <coughs> social media is a very easy way to <coughs> understand what young people are thinking right and it would be natural for us to like go on instagram and see what people are what what like these young lives are all about and you will see that people are posting about their lifestyle and their uh, you know just what they want to do or where they want to uh, just how meeting friends or or eating food but it's on youtube that i find the real influencers and the real influencers of india are not selling fashion or food they're selling not even jobs anymore but ways to earn money so you just have to put that that the one keyword earning and you can make the, the the most like random video about earning and thousands of comments about that you will get thousands of comments and i think that that's the world that i just can't pull away from because uh you know there's so much in those comments um and it's not even that these videos are actually telling them some great way to earn money some are but uh and and that's why like that to me that's where indian youth culture is uh, not not in the instagram posts and uh, and reels so you know i mean so i think that um 
it it gives me hope as as much as it gives it fills me with worry that um not everyone wants to get get stuck um they they want to move on in whatever way even if like a youtube video will give them a solution mhm that's fascinating uh snigda um you know and there's a lot of food for thought for us to really think about where the story of indian youth is going to go you know they're not suspended they've sort of taken things in your in their own hands um and it's not necessarily law and order but other things right and uh, and uh, and and that could be related to other you know issues in the future uh you know about our you know social stability but for now i mean i guess it seems like there is at least a partial happy ending in the sense that you know they seem to be trying to fend for themselves you know in the absence of a state that just has looked the other way um so um thank you so much you know i i'm going to stop my questions here snigda uh, i i really enjoyed uh, you know talking to you and i'm going to now invite um I guess hand it back to Sarthak, who will take questions from the audience, and I, I believe Sarthak, they are supposed to type it in the chat, right? No, but I think uh, they will be uh, typing it to your chat box because I have mentioned that. So okay. maybe if you listen to your chat box, might be getting questions. I uh, mean, well, I had actually, if I can just ask a question. Sure, you know. because I don't, I don't see any chat uh, okay. questions think, uh, on my. So yeah, just um, so anybody, if you have any questions, you can please uh, either direct them to me or to Mona. uh or through the chat right please do that uh if i can i mean thank you so much for a very you know very rich and very uh, uh you know very very fascinating discussion as i said in the beginning also i was hoping that it will be and of course it's uh, stood true to that uh i just had a like you know probably one question to begin with will be that uh, you talked about an indian dream and i was just wondering that what exactly or how can we actually or how do you perhaps define an indian dream because uh, um, i think uh, uh and mona talked about bank jobs right and i had uh, in patna or in bihar during my field work i had seen that you know uh, bank jobs or you know sarkari nokri government jobs are so important or somewhere we see that uh, learning english or in you know, a spoken english becomes uh, that kind of an aspiration uh, and and in other places like in in uh, getting some skills or getting certain kind of computer training or other things becomes that becomes a part of that indian dream so i just feel that uh, like an american dream which is there which is robust and which is uh, you know uh, probably uh, which is defined in terms in material terms right uh, i was just wondering that uh, would you be able to present uh, a clear picture of what exactly do you think is an indian dream uh, for today's indian youth uh, for all of us here for today i yes today's india i don't think there's any one dream um i think if i had to really um essentialize what i keep hearing from people it would be you know to to um to make their own lives um and i don't think that that was too earlier i think to me what seemed like an indian the indian dream was that if you you could rise out of your circumstances if you followed that the formula uh you went to school you got good good marks you sat the exams you followed all the job ads gave more exams and then got a job and then whatever you know and i think that that dream is already failing so i don't know to what extent that dream remains true the fact that indians still want government jobs is true but i don't think that fits into the dream aspect anymore i think even they understand that um that's the only thing that works okay okay uh yeah uh, uh, i still I don't have any i don't see any questions in the chat box uh patrick you have a question yes i did i did i ha- had a question really about the um the techniques that you use in order to research your books and your your journalism i remember when i sort of returned to academia discovering that quite a lot of what i'd written was field trips and that it was ethnography and that there were particular techniques i used which i then quite often got asked to speak about and it seems to me that you have developed those techniques to an extraordinarily acute level in order to get the material that you put into your in fact not just your books also in quite a lot of your journalism and i wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the kind of nuts and bolts of that uh in order to generate the kind of very detailed stories that you 
include in your work and you know that's that's really what makes it i think uh quite distinctive from run-of-the-mill writing just about how people are living what their values and what they're expecting Thanks, Patrick. Uh, it's actually just one thing um, that I continue to follow in, in everything since, and maybe before Dreamers, which is to um, A, spend a lot of time with the people, the sources, and then keep going back to them. So I think that to see them um, do whatever they're doing or to believe in whatever they're believing or whatever else, over a period of time has been, has given me really amazing material. So, um, so I can't think of one case in which I haven't gone back to someone sometimes so often at my own expense, because I feel like um, if they see me again, if they see me make the effort to go and see them, to, to, to live in their houses or to just keep tracking them as they do whatever they do, go to work or cook their food or drop their children to school. That's where these, in those moments, they, they you know, they- An example of that, because it's a very unusual technique, even though it's familiar to you. Just sort of explain how, a little maybe about how that how that works. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I met someone at a, at a court um, quite randomly. And she was going through a, a, a murder trial. And to me, it seemed like that trial was already coming to an end and um, she would be convicted. But she said something or I heard something, I heard her say something in the court that made me think that I wanna tell her story. And I, and I kept going back to the city, to Jaipur and to, to, to keep seeking interviews with her in jail. I never wrote that story, so don't ask me what it is, but, but to just keep, keep trying to meet her, keep talking to her. And so many of these interviews, she wouldn't say anything, but but she also kept saying that I made that effort um, and no publication was paying me for it, but I was just so interested in her and, and hearing her story um, that she began to talk later. And um, I have, yeah, I've done this in so many instances where I would meet someone for a story, like I, I in the sometimes would send me to cover something um, you know, uh, I don't know. It could like, you know, it just could be like a flood in Kerala and, and, I, and I would meet someone and I would, they would say something and I, and I know, I think that I've over, over uh, the past 10 years, um, I have uh, developed a sense for characters. So I, I know um, when I meet someone and they just have to say one thing to me and I know that I'll, that 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 um, that I have to go back to them because they it'll be a great story. So uh, so that sense keeps getting sharper of of character and stories. And it's only because I am so fiction obsessed that if someone says something to me, I I am obsessed with speech, and I just know that for that just one thing that they said, I'll I'll make something out of it. So I'm also extremely selfish that way, and I just keep hoping that I don't end up exploiting people or being intrusive. And I, I have become better. I used to be much more intrusive. I would not leave someone's house, um, not give them any personal space. But I have, I'm, as I grow older myself, I understand that. I understand that people may not want to talk to me all the time and I, and I give them more space now. But I, um, but I compensate for that by going, going back to them more often. So, uh, so, so thank you. And actually, on this, so we we do have some questions in the chat, and I'm going to direct uh, uh, you know one that actually relates uh, Snigda to your profession and your techniques, and that's from Professor Jimol Unni. Um, uh, let uh, perhaps I can should I just unmute people and they can ask their questions? Is that okay, Sartaj? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there are okay. less questions, we can do that. Okay. So I there are only three questions so far. I'm going to unmute Professor Unni, and she can ask her question. Okay. Hello. Uh, yeah, hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Hi. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry. Uh, it's because uh, we are, you know, I'm an economist and we're training people as economists here uh, in a BA and an MA program. Uh, but, um, you know, there are many of the economists who want to be journalists. 
So uh, we always wonder how, how we do that because economic journalism is becoming very, very popular. And there are a lot of online and, um, you know, real uh, print media, which is doing economic journalism. So we always have this thing in mind. Is it okay for us to just teach them economics and they can become journalists? Or does, so my question in the chat box was, uh, does journalism require <laughs> training in journalism? Or, you know, can, so like, you know, my daughter is a scientist and she always has this dream that one day she'll write popular science. So, which I think she's quite capable of. But then, you know, what do you think? That's what I wanted to ask. Uh, sorry, I can't see your name. Um, uh, My name is Gmol, Gmoloni. Hi, Gmol. I, um, I am quite conflicted about it myself. I studied journalism and I think that it did help me get some basics in order, but it's, it's, they're not really hard to learn. So um, I really wouldn't advise anyone to leave any discipline of study and study journalism, but um, but it's it's a you know it's a really complicated craft and it takes years to study. So there are two ways to go about it. You can be an economist and write. I think my my husband is an econ economist and he writes much more than I do. Um, even I can't read most of what he writes because he writes so much. Um, but uh, so you can write that. You can be a, a doctor and write. I have friends who are doctors and who write. Uh, I'm sure you you read people in in print on web who are not career journalists. So that's one thing and that's the best way to go. But if they want to become journalists, I would say still finish your discipline and become a journalist, except that, you know, then just uh, to be like a career journalist, they, yeah, it's a, it's a, they'll have to spend some years just learning on the job. It's not hard, but it's not easy either. So I wouldn't say that you studied um, economics and then you started join the newspaper and you'd just become a journalist. You can practically, but to be good at it, it it'll take some years. So um, I don't know if I've helped. Yeah, thanks. But they can they can reach out to me. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, so, so, so the next question is from Ashok Singhvi and I'm actually going to unmute Ashok. Uh, so you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, ma'am, it was a fascinating uh, talk and fascinating discussion. I'm a scientist and uh, <clears throat> I would like you to stargaze in say 10 or 15 years from now about India. And you are looking at India, which has now a new caste system evolving of internet haves and have nots. We had Brahmins earlier who were educated. Now we have internet haves. And so we have 10% of students getting the highest education. 90% of students are not getting it. So in that context, secondly, with the artificial intelligence and the robotics and everything, the jobs are going to go down. So 10 years from now, given that 90% of India will be poorly educated, without resources, exposed to scams of the kind you talk about, daily exposed, what would be India like? Uh, can you start case and see, I, mean, I feel very scared about future of India. And remember our interpretations based on YouTube and social media indicates two things. Firstly, we are looking at a very small sample size of the Indian community because very few are internet enabled. And second thing is the level of inter uh, interaction on the social media indicates that the youth have no work to do. So they are active on internet and the social media. So if I have to do my uh, daily job. So I think there's a worry, some trend that is coming up that youth which are educated and internet enabled have no work to do. And these are 90% of the youth who have no, uh, no future because they are not even educated properly. Okay, so thank you. Yes. Sorry, there are other questions. Um, yeah. If I can uh, ask you to quickly summarize and then she can answer. I, 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 I've got it, I've got it. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, no, so thanks Ashok. It's a fascinating question and I and I wish we could just talk about that. Uh, I, I think about this a lot on just, in just technology, technological access and how that will go. Um, so first of all, I don't think that being online is in some kind of contradiction to not having work to do. Uh, I think the way that I 
see it going is that um, for the youngsters, it's common to find a way to be online and make money. And I don't just mean scams. You know, you there. Um, I am going to write about something. I'm, I'm going to write about one of those things where you have these new apps, like even Google is now launching these apps where you can be online, you can like posts and 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 um, get paid for it or watch a video or complete some tasks, even like, you know, fill up a, fill up a survey or whatever. So I think that that's going to be more and more common. So there won't be that bifurcation. And second, yeah, sure, there'll be AI and people will lose jobs, but also like technology will become more and more accessible and people will find their own way to, um, you know, beat access to education or access to say an, uh, IIT kind of training to 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 make technology work at whatever level they are, and that's already happening, right? We already have internet haves and have nots. We already have like this huge disparity in um, education level or English language uh, ownership, and and yet people, you know, make technology work at wherever they are uh, and with whatever data they have or whatever you know smartphone model they have. So, um, so I'm I'm not. I'm not a I'm not a tech skeptic to be to be honest, and I think that's uh, that's in short my my view. So, uh, Thanks, Nikta. What do I see in 2035? I mean, I just see that as a very chaotic place where you know, I mean, people will try to make, as I said, technology work for them, um, irrespective of where where they are. So I don't think that everyone will have access to AI uh, education or uh, the same level of internet access, but it'll, it'll open up more opportunities um, and more, more enterprise. Thanks. I think the next question is from Kunal, who's from Ranchi, and I'm going to ask him to, uh, you know, uh, unmute and ask his question. Kunal, I can't see him. Uh, somehow. But... Well, his question is actually typed up. So for some reason, it's okay, not okay. getting sure, unmuted. Sure, sure. So let me just read it out. Um, sure. Am I audible? Is that Kunal? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, Kunal. great. Yes. Why yeah, don't you yeah, ask your question? Yeah. 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 Hello, Snigda. I'm from Ranchi and I've read your book, Dreamers. Um, it's like a really fascinating book. And uh, I'm a PhD student. I, I'm uh, studying politics in Jharkhand. So yeah, your like work is very interesting for me. So my question is, is it about big dreams and uh, structural barriers to achieve those dreams, which leads people to engage in such, such activities? Or it is more about the dire lack of opportunities to have a decent employment in the present scenario that makes people bypass the system that denies them opportunity. So another related question is, who are these scammers? Is there uh, like some kind of, uh, like what is their group belonging? Uh, why are certain scammers, uh, like we hear of scammers from certain regions and not from other regions? So like questions like that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think you answered your question yourself in the first part. So there is the lack of opportunities and there are structural issues, but I think that for me, there's, there's also a couple of other aspects. One is just the, you know, I mean, how I, I talk about the gap in salary and whatever you were able to make from a scam. And please don't forget that that's a huge incentive. I mean, it makes me rethink my career choices when some of the scammers talk to me. Um, so I mean, I, I was offered a job, scam job yesterday and they said, I'll just, I'll, I'll start with one lakh rupees. So this guy was going to give me one lakh rupees yesterday. And I thought, what am I doing with my life? So, uh, so yeah, so there is that. And um, yeah, I mean, let's, I, I will stop there. Um, who are the scammers? Yeah, really interesting question. Um, you know, a lot of them, I think that at the, at, the, at the cusp of like finishing their education and getting a job. So that's a, uh, that's a very sort of common point in their lives. Uh, I also know people who have been in the workforce for some time and then like dropped off, but mostly, mostly young. Interesting point about uh, regions. So I think that, you know, the, 
I'm writing about it currently, but I think that the India's like hub of cyber scams, whether you talk about phishing or OLX or KYC or whatever, loans, whatever. I mean, these, interestingly, the hubs of cyber scams are also like regions in India that are the most underdeveloped. So, or poorest, poorest parts of India, including Jharkhand. So, I mean, there's something happening there, right? So you can immediately sort of link that 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 kind of like poverty and lack of opportunity. I've, I've been to some of these regions, um, but I think that's, it's not just um, one region. I think that that is, that kind of trend is already spreading. So I think I, I spoke very initially in the, in the conversation about how that kind of like Jantara model is now being created elsewhere in India, including in, in South India, in Karnataka. So um, so I think that uh, if people are more connected, obviously internet has played its role and people see that if someone, if this village can do this, so can we. Um, and Worryingly, I, that that's going to be more and more sets of villages across India. Um, so yeah, let's just get ready for that. Thanks. Um, so we have another question from um, Sharmita Lahiri, and she's not able to unmute. So I'm going to read out her question. Um, she says, you mentioned that it's not the youth alone in the villages, but even the elderly population who are engaged in the scams. What would you say uh, accounts for the shift in the moral compass? Because that generation did a adhere to a, to a strict sense of right and wrong um, at one time. So how do you explain that? I, I, yeah, thanks for whoever asked. I think that I, you know, these are, we're talking about like villagers. I mean, for this insurance scam, I was in this very, very rural parts of Haryana. And, you know, these people have spent their whole lives just being taken for granted by the police and courts and the, you know, the government officers who are going to give them some scheme or the other, but even to like get a job under Narega, they have to pay a bribe, right? So, so, and I'm talking about these people who colluded with the, uh, with the gang were as old as 70 years old, 80 years old. So you're right in saying what changed. And I think that that changed. I mean, being, being, um, you know, a victim to the system for almost your life. And then, and then someone comes to you and says, you know, you can change that with like just one, um, one very easy signature. And why wouldn't you agree? Um, so for me, it was not so hard to see that motivation. So I, I, I don't think that I, I think about ethical boundaries and moral compass in the naive way that I, that I used to. I think it's also about, you know, what, how systems work and people are not stupid. They see that they, you know, they've been, um, they've been manipulated for most of the time. You know, they have had to pay, stand in lines and for hours and pay bribes and being kicked about for, for generations. And so, so why shouldn't they take that opportunity to turn, turn the table back? Um, I, I hope that's, that explains. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, and um, so, you know, just to piggyback on that as a quick follow up, um, you know, it's also the context, right, the larger context. I mean, perhaps today you can get away with a lot that you perhaps that you couldn't before. Do you think that plays a role? Uh, the sort of larger Oh, yeah, yeah, we haven't context, spoken. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't spoken about law and order at all. So, you know, you can also bribe the police to not get caught. So in all these tactical scams and insurance scams, the police are again bribed. So if the, you know, I mean, the system can work for anyone who has the means. The, so that corruption, it's just about, you know, someone um, creating the right circumstances. And so anyone can use that system to, um, to become rich or to take advantage of the other party. So I think it's it's interesting how the villagers are then using the same system to bribe the prosecutors, in fact, the court, the police and everything to, to actually scam the government. So there's one more question from Dotuna Banerjee. Um, and uh, perhaps can you unmute her? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think Arpita has to do that. Dotuna Banerjee. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. 
Hi, um, so thanks for the fascinating you know, discussion. Uh, I have a question. Um, so I am a political scientist. So I, am, I look at this, you know, the young people's collectives, especially people who are doing, um, you know, different kinds of uh, jobs uh, in the urban area and move from the uh, rural areas, especially in Ahmedabad. So my question would be in your study, okay. and um, what kind of collectives uh, do you know the young people mostly build or hold on to in terms times of crisis or when they start you know when they get into startup ventures or you know even when they move from one place to another place for job uh, what kind of do you see um, you know caste collectives or region based collectives and uh, things like that so i wanted to know that thanks yeah yeah uh, yeah very interesting i i i mean i mostly follow the the making of these communities um, online, especially on social media. And interestingly, as you said yourself, these people do um, help each other, whether they make a Facebook group or they make, or they bond in the comments or uh, in whatever, you know, social media formats. I see the, these forming of communities all the time, but uh, it's very region-based, language-based, caste-based. Um, and there's a lot of solidarity, especially amongst Dalits, especially amongst like women, I've, I, I am a part of a Facebook community where um, only like young women from rural areas, rural like Hindi speaking areas discuss things with each other. And there's, it's so fascinating. They talk about jobs, sex like, so much, um, you know, just like common dilemmas about how to move out or how, where to live, how to negotiate uh, uh, salary raise, a lot of times just how to how to negotiate dating and marriage pressure and all that so uh so i think it you know when you're online it's it's like easier to figure out peer groups and and also to organize um discussions and, and help out each other I'm, I'm 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 sorry that i i don't know that much about the physical manifestation of it but um you would know and i would love to hear about that but um, yeah, but I think that these communities are very, very sort of um, focused on identity and uh, concerns. Thanks. Sarthak, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, I just, uh, it, I mean, uh, I just want to ask a question related to the last answer that uh, Sindha gave. Uh, so, I mean, I heard that in answer to Patrick's question, you just mentioned that how building trust with your respondents also by in, in a physical form is possible, right? By re reiterating your uh, repetitive uh, interactions, etc. I was just wondering, how do you then build trust in uh, these digital interfaces or these digital follow-ups uh, uh, by, you know, following them on social media or uh, to be able to pa be part of this kind of a group in which uh, maybe, you know, some intimate uh, information or some intimate kind of discussion about dating or marriage or marital problems, etc. is going on. Uh, so I was just wondering, because uh, many of us now, uh, given this entire COVID situation, are also uh, trying to, you know, navigate through these ideas of uh, digital ethnography and social media research, etc. Yeah. So I think it will be a very useful uh, somehow, you know, point for us to consider also. Uh, thanks, Sartak. I am, um, there's rarely anyone who I, if I want to write about, I won't meet physically. So that's, that goes for me. That's one of my rules. So I, I, I do a lot of like online social media um, research, but if I, when I know that there's some, whether it's a group or a person or a, or a thing or a city or whatever that I want to write about, then I'll physically visit that physically make a visit and I'll keep uh, and I'll keep visiting and trust building uh, earlier I used to be quite journalistic about it in that like this whole I used to just do Q and A's or um, just sit down and ask questions but I I have grown up about that so uh, so I, I realized that you can't really build trust if you just keep asking questions so I so I just like have more and more open-ended conversations. I tell them a lot about my life that I won't even, sometimes it's easier for me to tell strangers than, I, than it is for me to tell friends. Um, so, and and just usual stuff, what are you, what did you cook or what's going on with your in-laws or including mine. 
or my husband or my friends or whatever, you know, if I have to bitch about my mom or whatever. So I, I do that quite openly and without any kind of strategy. And uh, they see that and a lot of, a lot of them advise me on, on, on how to, how to deal those, with those situations. And it, and it gives them a sense that I, that they too are a part of my life in a way that I want to be a part of theirs. And that has helped me progressively in building relationships and, uh, and then also like when, you know, a story is over for me, because unlike you guys, stories are, forget a book, but, you know, a story, I'll spend two, maybe three months on one thing. And I, it's easy for me to move on, but I'll, I just keep maintaining those conversations or just, um, you know, it's easy WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever it is, I'll, I'll, I just keep like, I keep talking to them and uh, yeah, I, so that, that that's the trust part of it. Great. No, thank you, thank you. That's actually very useful for many of us, I, I believe. Thank you. So, so we have time for just one last question and that's from uh, Shilpa Pandit. Uh, if you can please unmute her and that'll be our last question. Yeah, let me just do thank you, thank you, Mona. And thank you, Snigda, for a very interesting conversation and a talk. Uh, I have two points and I wanted your view on them. Uh, you know, when about 10, 15 years back, we were talking about the demographic dividend and there was always this question about how to create the systems which were fit for, you know, having that demographic dividend. Now, it seems to me, and I want your view on this, that on the surface level, the generation, since the systems are not res responding, the, on the surface mm -hmm. level, the generation has picked uh, to um, navigate or negotiate on work related issues. And at the non-surface level, at the deeper level, they have chosen for a continuity in their uh, uh, social uh, or cultural aspects. Mm -hmm. So on the work level, which is, uh, so you, we, were, uh, we, we could be, pro we were thinking at that point of time that if we do not have the enough systems, then we would have some kind of a social unrest or any kind of an issue can happen with the young, so, so much of uh, demographic bulge. So it seems to me that at the surface level, they are navigating and negotiating on work and employment. And at the deeper level, they are keeping those stabilities intact of social and cultural systems. And in, if that is the choice, then identity politics and the continuity of the prejudices and all sits well with the stability of the social and cultural systems. And the scamming sits well with the active navigation and negotiation at the work level. What is your view on that? That's point number one. The point number two is psychologists have said that because of globalization, people are able to access cognitively a lot of things that are happening in other parts of the world, which makes people think that what is happening in their local spaces is not enough. And that also mm -hmm. drives the aspiration of the people. Uh, at the same time, what you have said about technology being a, being a disruptor in the kind of status quo. So, what is your view? What is driving that aspiration? And because you're looking at something which is in the globalization context and not available in the local, does it lead to more lack of visualization, what it needs to enact it on ground? Or uh, lack of, you know, for example, you said just by going to school is not enough just by earning 10, obviously 10,000 is not enough. So I want your view on aspiration. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of that answer is already there. I, um, you don't need to, I, you don't need, need me to say this, that, that, you know, everyone, like even in the villages, they know today what, how much you need to earn to be able to live well or what are you know you like what are the like material objects in your life that you need so i remember going to the poorest one of the poorest if not the poorest districts in in india uh, it's in in some up and i when i met this guy there at the skill center and he was saying that um uh, 
he wants to make rupees 1 lakh a month no more no less and i wasn't talking to him his instructor was talking to him and he asked him why and he said because that's much he said very lucidly that that is how much a man should make today in order to be called successful i don't know how and where he got the idea about 1 lakh a month but you 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 see it makes sense i mean that's how much a lot of people in uh in urban areas make in order to call themselves successful so um so there is they thanks to internet and, and social media and just like larger exposure to the world they do understand very well you know what success means um and they and they want that and i th- i i think that globalization also works in a in a counter way which you also kind of into that in your own question which is um which is that this bifurcation of like you know um aspiration and um so like cultural values is not just happening in india right on the one hand people do want to make live far uh you know i mean like have a life that is dramatically different to their their families or communities lives but but follow the same systems um it's it's common for me to meet someone in in a village i and i anywhere i mean whether be it kerala or um or jharkhand and they'll they'll have very ambitious views about where they want to be in their lives in terms of work income so and those things itself can matter based on the region but they those ideas are very big but on the one, on the other hand when i ask them simple questions and i ask this question i guess i ask everyone this question about love and marriage and and gender and and family and society they all like most of them have seen no problem with arranged marriage or their families choosing who they will marry or you know or 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 that or or believing in the fact that or believing in the idea that women shouldn't work after marriage or um you know that men should marry women and women should marry men so i mean i i have questioned them on it and they they don't seem to see the contradiction that i am seeing um and i am not an expert on this but i but i feel like obviously there's so much churning in their lives that believing in in those passed down ideas gives them a sense of stability whereas um you know the like the desire to you know make much more money or live a far grander life than the past generation does not seem to me seem to seem to them to be like a natural progression like a or and not like a break from tradition whereas the taking a stand on marriage or or gender roles would seem a break seem like a break um so i yeah i think and then they could, they seem to live peacefully with that contradiction so um you know so who so who are we to <laughs> keep questioning them and yet we keep questioning them um thank you so much snigda i mean you know i i really enjoyed our conversation i thought there were so many interesting points that came up and um i can hardly wait to read your next book um but um i just want to say thank you again for engaging uh, so insightfully on this subject and uh, i will hand over now to sarthak right uh, thank you so much mona and uh, like you said we all i think eagerly await uh, to read your next book uh, which i'm sure will be you know as interesting and as insightful as your first book which we all loved uh, and uh, thank you so much again for being here and thanks to all the people who participated and all the people who asked questions and engaged with this topic and uh, your continuous support also helps us uh, to try and you know uh, Uh, organize these con- uh, events on a continuous basis and at a regular basis um, uh, at the seminar lecture series and uh, i i thank you all of you on behalf of the school of arts and sciences and amdabad university for uh, joining us here today thank you so much thank you